I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. As we enter into the new year in the Western Gregorian calendar, 2024, uh, I'd like to explore with you uh, a particular topic in the larger context of the focus recently on wise effort or right effort. And this is a particular aspect of right effort or wise effort that seems especially uh, relevant as we enter into the new year. So I'd like to offer a bit of a talk here, and then hopefully there'll be time for us to uh, explore it and talk about it with particular individuals, uh, either in the chat or maybe even one or two people alive, actually. So here's my question for you, a little provocative. What are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you coming to Wednesday meditation? Why are you here today? now in this life. Why? Right? What are we doing? And uh, I'm responding in part to a question that, that came to me, which is a wonderful, deep, simple, fundamental question, which basically is, well, what is Buddhist practice, really? Because there are many kinds. So I'd like to explore with you the why and the how of Buddhist practice in an overview kind of way, aiming toward uh, a very practical exploration of ways of being that call to you, that would be particularly valuable for you to identify, to protect, and to cultivate this coming year. So let's think about the Buddha's own journey. What was his life about? As best we know, records coming down to us uh, 25 from 2,500 years ago, he was a privileged young man. He had everything going for him a baby on the way, or maybe just born, wealthy, uh, wife, life, and he walked away from all of it. Certainly in that is the moral question of abandoning his, his family and his young child. Um, I think appropriately understood in the context of his time, in any case, uh, certainly facing that his journey began by abandoning uh, his family. He went forth into homelessness, and then after seven years or so of very intensive practice with many acknowledged, uh, acknowledged attainments along the way, he found for himself that complete liberation of the heart. Uh, and uh, upon the occasion in which he said, essentially, uh, that which was there to do in this life has been done. What was that? condition he entered into, he sought a reliable, stable, unconditioned, not based on changing conditions, basis for profound inner peace. He kept going. He experienced many blisses. He had many realizations, probably had many cosmic experiences, but each one of them faded. It didn't last. And he was searching for that ultimate happiness, that ultimate inner peace that ultimate love that lasts under all conditions. And he found it. And he taught from that place for the next 40 or so years. What did he find? The way he described it was that in his mind, there was no longer the capacity for hatred or greed or delusion. It just couldn't occur. In other words, and it wasn't a blank, he didn't go numb. He was described as the happy one. People flocked to him, not just because he was without hatred, greed, or delusion, but because he was with love and contentment and wisdom. So, in early Buddhism, on the basis certainly of what's called sila, translated as morality or restraint, ethics or virtue, and along with metta, 
friendliness, kindness, compassion, love, the aim of practice in early Buddhism that the Buddha taught was to be an arahant, the highest attainment, the ultimate, the greatest of all time. (laughs) In sports lingo, the goat, G-O-A-T, is to be an arahant in early Buddhist practice. And one who, like the Buddha, is incapable of hatred, greed, or delusion, and also utterly, irrevocably empty of the presumption of self. And in the attainment of that ultimate aim of practice, which the Buddha himself attained and invited others to attain as well, in that way of looking at things, how he talked about it, there would no longer be the basis There would no longer be the conditions leading to future rebirth. That's a framework. Uh, You don't have to believe in rebirth, reincarnation, rebirth, um, to be interested in a mind, a way of being, a consciousness that's utterly free of hatred, greed, and delusion, and utterly immersed in love and contentment and wisdom, even as the pains of life, the uh, the first darts of sorrow over losing a loved one or um, feeling physically ill, even as those so-called first darts, first arrows of life wash through awareness, you're still fundamentally in touch with and rested in Um, a lovingness, a contentment, uh, a wisdom, and an inner peace. Now, it's an important point here. It's not that we are trying to seek the ending of birth, of rebirth. We're not trying to escape from this world. Some people can frame it in that way, but that's not really central to what our best guess is, what the Buddha taught or thought or experienced. As it happens, at the upper reaches of human potential, with full awakening, there are no longer any conditions. There's no longer any clinging, any craving. There's no longer any attachment in the sense of clinging and craving. There's nothing, there's no more fuel that perpetuates in Buddhist cosmology, the long cycle of birth, life, death, rebirth. Follow that? It's not that you're seeking an ending to the cycle of births, although sometimes that tone slips in. It's more that it's just as the result of the gradual falling away of the fetters, the binds, the, the things that tie us up. gradually replaced by a complete freedom in the heart. So that's the aim of practice laid out in the Pali Canon, pretty much, the, you know, a a central surviving uh, written record of the Buddha's teachings. And then Buddhism, Buddhism evolved. Buddhism evolved over the next thousand years or so, both in Northern India, and it, as it spread into Tibet and China, and a couple of interesting things happened in that evolution. One is that foundationally, the Buddha said that it was up to each person to find their own path of awakening and to be sometimes translated as a, a light unto themselves in his dying words, or as Stephen Batchelor translates it, Things fall apart, the Buddha said on his deathbed. Tread your path with care. Different translations. So foundationally, we are each responsible for our own practice. And so when you face the question of, what are you doing here? What are you doing with this breath? Mary Oliver put it, what is it that you plan to do? with your one wild and precious life. As you contemplate on that question yourself, 
in the Buddhist context, there's an underlying emphasis on personal responsibility, that it is up to each of us to practice and to do our practices and to find for ourselves what rings true and what is useful and what is wholesome for us and calls our heart. So that's the, the fundamental North Star. That's the, that's the beam that we're flying home, uh, tuning into as we come to a hopefully soft and enlightened landing. Second thing that happened was that um, there was an increasingly analytic emphasis on inner practice with the development of the Abhidhamma and other related texts and teachings in which consciousness was increasingly deconstructed with complex models and sequences and trainings meditatively in these sequences. It all got pretty elaborate and really kind of conceptual, probably useful to some extent. I mean, there were reasons why people did it, uh, but it, you know, it was pretty dry, pretty heady, if you will. So that started to happen. And then meanwhile, as Buddhism moved into Tibet and then into China, this uh, aspiration began to become increasingly developed to be a bodhisattva rather than an arahant. In other words, to uh, become someone who as a bodhisattva was certainly very developed in practice, but postponed ultimate awakening and freedom from the cycle of rebirth in that cosmology, postponing that to bring others along. You know, the, the bodhisattva vow, uh, one aspect of it is, you know, beings are numberless, infinite. I vow to free them all. So it's very aspirational. Uh, it's very service-oriented. You know, there are certain aspects of the Arahant ideal that are about one's own awakening in a context of sila and metta, in a context of virtue and lovingness, certainly. But still, it's, it's about your own waking up. And the Bodhisattva vow took that um, approach and then, you know, emphasized bringing others along. Uh, I love the proverb, uh, I believe, from Africa uh, of we walk each other home, right? The Bodhisattva vow is very much a commitment to walk others home. So let's consider certainly both of these. We can imagine the combination of these two aims of practice, right? Including how they affect you today, where you are with the people around you, with how you approach your bedtime, what, and then what you do tomorrow and every day after that, right? We can imagine combining these two. You might imagine, you know, combining both rigorous personal development. The Buddha, <laughs> you know, he approached practice with gusto, uh, with determination, with rigor. He went for it, right? Um, my wife, Jan, and I are taking great pleasure, uh, hopefully a wholesome one, in the San Francisco 49ers this year, uh, a professional football team in America. And, you know, one can certainly be aware of the underlying aggressiveness and violence in the sport and the ways that it can harm people's bodies and, you know, we can be aware of those aspects of what's true while also you know, delighting in the, the teamwork, the camaraderie, um, the unlikely story of uh, their quarterback uh, picked absolutely last in the NFL draft and yet becoming, you know, credibly one of the top 10, if not five, if not even better quarterbacks in the National Football League right now. And we can delight in all those things, right? And as part of that delight, you can really appreciate the work ethic of people in sports and in other sports as well, who work really hard and, and who really are oriented with their coaches and careful watching a film to improve 
You know, they pay attention. They think about, oh, okay. They don't beat themselves up, but they do really focus rigorously on how to improve. Uh, what happened? What was useful? Eh, what was problematic? And okay, okay, with gusto, with good faith and a kind of enthusiasm. Uh, how can I do better next time? You know, imagine applying, and that to me that approach is really very much in, um, you know, the Buddha's teachings and his own personal example. I, I admit it. I admit it. I'm right now having a lot of very comical images of a bunch of kind of austere <laughs> monastics, you know, with shaved heads and and robes, playing football and making plays and throwing the ball to each other and, oh yeah, you know, practicing together. So, <laughs> comic, but there is really a combination uh, of that. You can imagine, if you like, differently a symphony orchestra, the training of musicians, or any other discipline, cooking, where people really focus on getting good at it. Um, and we can bring that same spirit, you know, kind of the arahant aspiration in our daily practice, while also keeping in mind the bodhisattva spirit of far-reaching pro-social, compassionate action. So we can bring these two together in how we approach uh, each day in this coming year. What might that be like for you? Also, as context, certainly we can focus on what is immediately in front of us. You know, working through a squabble that we're kind of in the middle of or feeling less afflicted by trauma or our personal history, even if it wasn't traumatic. Uh, we can certainly focus on solving particular problems, you know, what to do about this thing at work or, you know, this situation in our home. We can focus on becoming less caught by various addictions, less prickly and worried and reactive. There's certainly a place for that. The Buddha emphasized, certainly, because he taught householders, uh, as well as monastics, and in his view, full awakening ought to be available and was available for everyone, including regardless of gender or social class. Um, we can do those things that are absolutely important and worthy while uh, finding, um, as he put it, that happiness which is visible in this present life. The ordinary but wholesome happiness of you know, enjoying others, rooting your favorite team on, um, making a nice meal, you know, preserving what you've earned through, you know, right livelihood and, and enjoying it, the fruits of your labor. Certainly that. We can do all those things and, and. The Buddha encouraged us to keep our eyes on the ultimate prize even as we practice with what is immediately in front of us. For me, it, it takes the form of really appreciating the highest peak, the mountain of awakening, if you will, the snowy peak, and having a sense of a path that leads from the current swamp <laughs> or, or dusty plains or even lower foothills all the way onward, and both taking the step in front of us that's immediately there to take while keeping in mind our ultimate aspirations. Why not? Why not keep lifting our gaze to the horizon and beyond, you know, where we are going, which is to be certainly, and I'll be getting to this, included and implemented in our present life. You know, my first encounters with Buddhism in America for many, many years, it, if, when I look back on it, it was kind of Buddhism light. It was nice. There was an emphasis on, you know, be more mindful. That's good. Be kinder. That's good. But is that it? You know, it wasn't until after I'd spent quite a bit of time in Western Buddhist circles before I stumbled on or had presented to me the real aspirational, ultimate aspects of practice. Let's keep those in mind, even as we take the steps in front of us. Okay, so this is a, a focus on why. 
Now let's talk about how. How to do it. So how will you do it, whatever it is for you, in this coming year? What's important to you? What will you focus on? What will you open into, surrender into, give yourself over to with devotion, renouncing all else, as Eugene Cash put it about the breath. Devoted to, renouncing all else. What efforts will you make toward what ends this year? So I'd like to explore that with you right now in a particular way. Personally, I find it really helpful to approach this question in the in terms of, as people put it, be the change you seek. Or as the Tibetan proverb has it, take the fruit as the path. In other words, certainly, and, and I teach this and other people teach it, there are many methods in Buddhism, in you know, early Buddhism as it's expressed uh, uh, a lot currently, what's called Theravadan Buddhism, Vipassana-centered Buddhism. Also, we have Tibetan practices, Chan moving through China, then Zen and Pure Land. There are many, many things to do. I'm just going to emphasize one particular approach here, uh, which is to take the fruit as the path. In other words, to focus on particular qualities of being that are both the aims of practice and means to those ends. And to focus on them, these ways of being, and call them into being or turn toward them if they're already present and protect them and nurture them and grow them. This approach to practice, in other words, to orient toward ways of being, qualities of being, is very intimate. I'll, I like it because it's intimate with yourself. It's experiential. It's emotional. It's somatic. It's more about what you feel than what you think. It's more about the state of your body than preoccupations with terminology or language. And it's effective to focus on ways of being since being is the wellspring of doing. Being is the origin point. And a focus on ways of being tends to take less effort. Instead of willpower top down that's vulnerable to what's called willpower fatigue, you are more giving yourself over to what is already true within you, All right? You are giving yourself over to it and helping it fill your mind and carry you along. For example, there's a lovely quotation here that I will put into the chat in a moment as I copy it. These are ways of being. Generosity is a way of being. The quotation is, cultivate generosity, a life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. All right. so giving oneself over to generosity, one of the paramis, one of the perfections uh, that is developed in us, including and realized in a full bodhisattva, uh, the word dana, generosity, is one you might be familiar with. Generosity and a life of peace, right? And uh, a mind of love. These are things, these are ways of being, as an example, all right? So this year, for this year, right now, I invite you to consider what you would like to call into being inside yourself. What would you like to turn toward as ways of being and protect and nurture and grow? Are there intuitions you have about ways of being, attitudes, guiding principles, values, etc., 
that call to you. For myself, for example, um, a way of being that I've been appreciating, right? What you appreciate grows. Uh, I've been appreciating and um, helping myself um, move into more rapidly <laughs> than I have in the past and uh, be rested in kind of more and more stably uh, is to disengage from little forms of contentiousness or struggle with others that are unnecessary, unwise. Uh, it's to kind of, you know, I forgive me, but I'm thinking of the, the line from an advertisement, drop the chalupa or something, where you just, just uh, you know, you back out. Okay, back out. And, you know, in that way of being, I try to let go of any kind of derisiveness, any kind of eye roll, like whatever, you know, not that, not that, just a real clean, okay, <laughs> you know, like that. That's a way of being. That's quite uh, quite personal. Um, <clears throat> another way of being that you know has been there for me in the last year or two uh, is being you know more uh, d disengaged from pounding my point. Yeah, um, you know uh, another way of being uh, that really um, has been a focus for a number of years was kind of the result of a retreat I was on, one of the key results some time ago, just really appreciating patience. Patience also is one of the perfections, one of the paramis that get developed in a bodhisattva. So it's it's really okay to bring it down to earth. There's often so, a kind of a knowing of a way of being that that's available to you. I mean, it's not completely out of reach, but yeah, yeah, that's one to kind of rest in more as I can. You might consider particular stressful situations or relationships. You know, an adult child, maybe, um, an aging parent, um, a partner, a business relationship that's a work relationship, maybe it's kind of awkward, maybe a situation, maybe a group of people. You know, what ways of being, in other words, what what qualities in your body, what states of being in your body, what, or, what postures, what orientations, what ways of approaching or entering into that relationship or interaction or situation would be helpful to you. That's what I mean by ways of being, qualities, general qualities. Um, could be perspectives or attitudes or intentions that are alive for you, that are ways of being that would help you in particular ways? What would help you if it were more active or stable inside you? You might like to add examples into the, into the chat, as I can see Linda and other people are, are doing. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm particularly, I would say, encouraging here, um, not you know, old shoulds, but but things that actually really speak to your heart and you really value, you know, you really you really do care about and 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 ring true to you. you know? And sometimes they'll be quite particular. Uh, there might be a word or an image. You know, sometimes I think it's helpful to to sort of bring to mind people that you've gained from who've been models for you, who've helped you along the way. And how are they? You know, how, how do they act? Uh, I remember um, when I first joined the board at Spirit Rock Meditation Center uh, quite a while ago, uh, I would watch the teachers, the people who were the, they were the teachers and on the board and about, I don't know, 20 or so people. And somehow I lucked into the situation. I was there and some other people like me who had you know, general backgrounds. And, and I would sort of watch how the teachers were and I would watch them disagree about something. And uh, it was very interesting. You know, I would just sort of watch how they handled disagreement. They would make a point 
it would, often would have a certain gravity to it, a certain weight. Then another person would make a different point or a counterpoint, and then the, then the person then I would watch what the first person would do. And if it had been me, I would have argued back, right? And they just would hear and receive the counterpoint and allow it room to breathe. And then another point would be made. And maybe at the very end of it all, they might go back to their original point or have kind of a higher order uh, synthesis of everything. But they weren't reactive around it. And I went, wow, that's a way of being. <laughs> so I started modeling how they were, right? We can kind of model or channel or reverse engineer how other people are. These are just different ways. And you might, I don't know, be even writing some things down for yourself right now. What are some key ways of being for you that are both aims for you and also um, methods for you, a path for you that you can really highlight as you take a look at this coming year? To nourish your reflections, consider these so-called Brahma Viharas, dwelling places, Viharas, abodes of awakened beings that are, of course, very down to earth and very available to us all to experience and then to cultivate and grow. Um, the four are translated in different ways. I'll be simple here. Kindness. The cultivation of kindness as a way of being. Compassion, you know, empathy for suffering plus benevolent, benevolence and a movement to help if you can. Compassion, a caring response to suffering. Um, happiness for others, celebrating their victories, uh, being delighted for them, being glad for them. Or the fourth Brahma Vihara, sometimes said to be the foundation of the other three, equanimity, which is a kind of emotional balance in the core of your being or underneath the surface agitations, a stillness, a stability, an evenness that is not apathetic or withdrawn, is, is open-hearted and content, but is not disturbed in the core, equanimity walking evenly over uneven ground. As um, I think Howard Thurgood, no, no, Howard Marshall, come to me, eh, come to me, please help me with this, uh, talked about looking out at the world with quiet eyes, equanimity. So these might be qualities that you'd like to develop in yourself this year. Letting people land in your heart. That's a way of being. Uh, being committed with your partner to slowing it down so they land and letting them land more inside you before you react. That's a way of being. Uh, being committed, you know, much of the time to recognize a kind of being behind the eyes in another person. That's a way of being in this life. Being a listener, someone who listens deeply and lets it land inside before re replying. That's a way of being. Huh? Also consider these ways of being that I focus on in my neurodharma material which for me um, are a very good summary of much of what it means to be awakened and also are a very good summary of uh, the path we can take toward our own awakening. So these are both fruits of practice and a path of practice. Steadiness, steadiness of mind. That's a way of being that might call to you this year to cultivate um, lovingness. We've spoken about that a fair amount already. Uh, what I call fullness 
which is the equanimity that comes from feeling already full, you know, already rested in enoughness so that there's little or no basis for craving. You know, a way of being that has little or no craving or clinging in it, in the present. That's a way of being. Also, what I call wholeness, by which I mean complete self-acceptance and uh, letting yourself be and being yourself as a whole, knowing that you can let yourself be and accept yourself fully while uh, regulating yourself, you know, kind of containing certain parts of yourself while encouraging others. That can all happen as you accept yourself. Another quality I call nowness, simply being in the present, a way of being that is very present, present in the present. That might be something you'd like to cultivate as a way of being. Then what I call allness, which is a growing sense of interconnectedness, inner being, as Thich Nhat Hanh put it, you know, the, the background if, or foreground sense of being a local expression of everything, connected to everything, um, supported and buoyed by everything rather than separated from it all and oppressed by it. Um, and then timelessness. And that's a quality, a sense of connectedness with whatever for you is, is ultimate. The ground, the absolute, the unconditioned, the divine, or simply a, a sense of mystery, ultimately. These might be qualities for you that you care about developing. And to be clear again, I'm focusing on you know, ways of being that uh, are certainly affected by our circumstances, other people, to be sure, great. You could say, oh, what a privilege it is to focus on ways of being. I would respond with the Buddha's teachings and also the example of many, many people who deal with really, really horrible situations. The more horrible your situations, the more important it is to cultivate ways of being that enable you to cope better with your situations and protect yourself on the inside as you deal with horribleness on the outside as best you can. Right. So finishing up, we've explored many different ways of being. What are wise efforts here related to all this, certain key wise efforts. And what are your efforts this year? First, there is the effort of knowing why you are here. I don't mean in so much an ultimate sense like meaning or purpose or some cosmological thing, but I mean your reasons, you know, for being here. <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> Now, today, now, in this life, what are you up to? What are you about? Uh, I don't mean like, why are you here? Why are you taking up space? You ought to get out of here. No, I mean for yourself. Oh, wow, what matters to me? What am I up to? What is it that I plan to do now with my one wild and precious life, right? This means this is the effort of knowing what you value and why. Why do you value it? What do you care about? What do you want to lean into and increasingly become, All right? Um, like maybe you value knowing one or a few ways of being that are, that are a particular focus for you this year. Second, besides the effort of knowing what you value, including ways of being that you value, there is the effort of being mindful of that way of being, knowing what it feels like. We can pay attention to it. We can make an effort to be acquainted with it and feel it, and in particular, enjoy it. The more we enjoy a way of being that we value, the more able we are to abide in it. Knowing what it is like, what is it like to be patient? What is it like to be a listener? What is it like to be equanimous? What is it like to be disengaged from squabbles with others, even if they try to suck you in? What is it like? 
maybe a way of being that you're encouraging is a kind of acceptance of yourself, a being at peace with who you are, all of you, every part of yourself. That's a way of being. Know what it's like so you can return to it. That's an effort. Third effort, there is the effort of helping that way of being to become more stable in you, more of a trait, not just a passing feeling or attitude or other state of mind. This is where, you know, the material I've developed a lot of taking in the good, deliberately internalizing beneficial experiences, in this case, beneficial experiences of uh, a particular way of being. Um, as we marinate in the experience, as we open our bodies to it, as we appreciate what feels good about it, as we let it spread inside us, as we let ourselves become it, right? It's more and more established in us. And that is an effort. That's a delicious kind of effort, usually, uh, a breath or two at a time, but breath after breath, synapse after synapse, we gradually hardwire that way of being into ourselves. That's an effort. That's the effort of learning. We don't just experience a way of being, right? We, we learn it, we cultivate it, we acquire it, we develop it. And fourth, there is the effort, once we know what it's like and we're growing it inside ourselves, of giving ourselves over to it. Ah. Letting it be enacted, the enactment of patience, the enactment of listening, the enactment of accepting yourself, um, the enactment of sobriety, uh, the enactment of disengaging from ill will or um, meanness toward others. You know, there's the enactment of those ways of being. We give ourselves over to them, we surrender to them. We let those ways of being have us, right? We kind of give control over. <laughs> to that way of being and let it be the current carrying you along in the stream of your life. Can you get a sense of what that is like, what that feels like? Giving over to in this fourth kind of effort related to ways of being, letting it carry you along. So as we finish here, then I want to take a minute or two just to kind of marinate in this right now. We have these four efforts related to ways of being that we appreciate, we value, that call to us intuitively. They feel right to us. They're the next important thing to develop. The effort of knowing what you value. Second, the effort of being mindful of what it feels like, what, they, what, what that experience is like, that way of, of that way of being. You're mindful of it. Third, you are cultivating it. You're making effort to learn from it, to take in the good, to let it land inside, to let yourself increasingly be this way. And then fourth, you are letting it carry you along. So imagine as we finish, for a minute or so here, kind of quietly together. Wow, what it would be like this year for you to let one or more wholesome ways of being that call to you, to let them carry you along this year. Let's be quiet for a minute together. I'm doing it with you imagining certain key ways of being and their benefits for you and others, carrying you along this year.
I wish this for you. I may not know you personally, and I wish this for you. And perhaps you will join me in wishing this for everyone else gathered here. And in fact, wishing this for anyone ever who listens to this or watches the video. We can wish this for them. You can wish this for them. And you can know that others are wishing this for you. This coming year and extending ever onward into your own future. 